Sabah al Khair. Thank you very much for your kind invitation to lead off the day about the future of cities and innovation in the MENA region. As an architect and urban designer, I have had the privilege of working in many cities in the region, from Biblos to Tyre, Sidon, Tripoli, Aleppo, Damascus, Fez, Alexandria, and if you stretch the limits of the region a bit, to Istanbul and Izmir. But I am an architect through and through, and by the very nature of the profession, I'm a generalist. So I cannot claim to have the depth of focus that many of the experts in the room have. For that, I wanted to talk to you about the one city I know quite a bit, my hometown, Beirut. I speak about Beirut with confidence. Even if I'm mistaken, even under the most expert scrutiny, I can still say what I say because I am from Beirut. It is as if Beirut speaks through me, absorbing me from my mistakes. I speak as an amateur, which in the original sense of the world means lover. I speak with all the biases, prejudices, and desires of a lover. I would have liked to bring some pictures, but I do not think pictures speak to the beauty of Beirut. I know you are here to make the MENA city smarter, less congested, more entrepreneurial, more equitable, more resilient, and hopefully more beautiful as well. But I ask you please to make sure that you do not take away those blemishes, those beauty spots that makes Beirut, Beirut, and that make me love Beirut. I tell you, Beirut has many lovers. Some of them are in this room, I am sure, who loves Beirut who hates Beirut, good. I'm in good company, but in competition as well. Built on a rocky promontory on the east of the Mediterranean under the shadow of Mount Lebanon, it projects out into the sea as a balcony onto the world. These are not my words, but another more poetic lover. It has thrived on the myth that it has been destroyed seven times and seven times rebuilt itself. An earthquake during the Roman era, plagues, famines, and civil wars. This image almost helps justify why Beirut is chaotic, almost always living on the brink, and almost always consuming itself to the ends of hedonism because it is fated to destroy itself only to rebuild itself. The self-consumption, this image of Beirut, is best captured by Egyptian novelist Sunhalla Ibrahim, who wrote an amazing portrait of the city called, appropriately, Beirut, Beirut. Now, you will say, wake up, spare us your foolish idolatry love. Beirut is ugly, Beirut is dirty, run down, corrupt, and unjust to its citizens. We need to fix it. True, we do. But I urge you to fix it from within, by learning how it could, self, how it could fix itself, how it has fixed itself, for some parts and to make the most out of the qualities that make Beirut, Beirut. Take as an example the traffic congestion problem. Many of you are working on these issues. This is a problem known to many cities in the region and around the world. A very weak public transportation system, a high level of private car ownership, bad traffic controls leading to high death tolls from car accidents, and the terrible shortage of parking and parking regulation that makes the city look like an endless second-hand car dealership. But then, when I'm stuck in traffic, it's often almost the case, in a standstill, I remember how empty the streets were during the war, and I feel much better. Again there, I'm not alone. Our eternal diva, Feruz, sang about being stuck in traffic when she remembered nostalgically pre-war Beirut. I will spare you my singing. <laughs> in traffic, I open the window and I chat with a complete stranger in a rusting car next to me. He has no air conditioning, so his car window is already open. And I also find no way of avoiding the insistence of the panhandler against my window. We talk. I learned she's a Syrian mother of three that used to be a teacher in her village. She's aiming to go back. She tells me how beautiful her village is and how ugly Beirut is. 
she's also in love. She leaves with a thousand liras, I leave with much more. Chance encounters and exchanges are both the precondition and outcome of urban life. This is what we came to the city for from the get-go. Aristotle tells us that. Opportunity, not affinity. Change, not inertia. Uncertainty, not constancy, prevail. Ask any innovation expert, strangers, immigrants, refugees, when they find an environment that supports their interaction, when they find hospitality, they thrive. Traffic jams do not make us thrive, but traffic makes us aware of each other across our class and ethnic differences in a way that our living rooms, malls, or air-conditioned restaurants do not. Again, I'm not advocating for traffic. I'm just asking you please to pay attention to the importance of the chance encounters that density and congestion generate, and that the super smart autonomy driven city that we're aspiring for, at least as it is being imagined today, will not. There is more to life in the city than getting to work on time. But hey, you will say, surely chance encounters can happen without congestion and chaos, and they do. Beirut, it is fair to say, is extremely chaotic. It is built on a hot, in a hodgepodge way with a building code that is written for flat terrains but applied to a hilly city. Imagine the consequences. It is designed to maximize exploitation rather than generate urban coherence, and it is applied in a rather lax way along with a land use law that mixes industry with residential with commercial haphazardly. This is more or less the case in many region cities, right? They did try to fix that in Beirut several times. Most recently, Beirut's downtown was destroyed during the Civil War of 1975-90, and they've tried to fix it by creating a more coherent center based on highlighting, selectively, the French mandate period and suppressing, or even that, destroying most of the rest. It went from mixing to homogeneity. They took away all land uses other than housing and office and commercial and separated those from each other in big swaths. They also reduced the number of shop doors. The shops got bigger, so the frequency of openings got less, creating longer walls along the streets, changing the pulse of the city. They also took away the mix that used to happen in apartment buildings. A shop on the street, a lawyer's office on the second floor, families of different income in the middle, unmarried workers, and some illicit activity on the roof. Remember Keshesh al Hakman, they are all gone. At a time when land use revisions are being enacted in cities around the world to allow for mixing of uses again in cities, to increase interactions between street and interiors, and to bring a downtown spirit into even suburban developments, we find ourselves in Beirut and the MENA region still relying on stale, let me call them American models, that neither correspond to our heritage nor to the future of cities around the world. Cities need mixture to create stronger proximities and densities, to reduce traffic and flexibility, and sorry, and they need flexibility to avoid blight. It turns out that the MENA region as, and its cities historically, with their souks, work-live setups, and mixed land uses are, after all, the model of the resilient cities to come. Why are we wasting them when they are the model? I'm not trying to be nostalgic, I hope it's clear, to a past that really did not exist. But I'm trying to ask you, please, to listen to the rhythm of the city that the new technologies will produce and to make sure that this rhythm is in sync with the rhythm of life. You will then tell me, but what about the deteriorating infrastructure, electricity, ele water, and telecom? Surely they need fixing. Surely we need new technologies there. And yes, Beirut's grid problems, especially its electricity problems, are by now tragic. A country with immense hydraulic resources has insisted on using fuel gas and has not managed to fix the war ravaged grid. That's been now 40 years. What emerged during the war as an emergency local generator network, however, as solutions, remains 40 years later the more secure way for generating power. The brilliance, let's call it also resilience of civil society in replacing the state during the war extends, extended itself to relief, housing, transportation, food supply. And now it continues because the state is still unable to provide across all of these areas. True, war then corruption have taken away the glitter from the Paris of the Middle East. 
but just look at how civil society has reacted and continues to react to this loss. The role of the state continues to be indispensable, as a hope, in providing the promise of equity when it comes to the provision of primary goods, health, infrastructure, education, we hope. But to close the gap between the promise and its realization, entrepreneurship again, and as we, sorry, entrepreneurship and civility emerge together at their best to bolster the infrastructure where it fails. Here again, and as we look to the future of the grid, off-grid solutions around the world are being increasingly evolved as the solution, not the problem. City governments are looking at the way communities, like Beiruti neighborhoods, have organized themselves in order to understand effective and grassroots participation in governance. And these communities have now been mobilized by Beiruti society to help stop development where it hurts, on the waterfront, highways and bridges that destroy the heritage, and it has proven to be extremely effective. The presence of an active and engaged civil society is the precondition and the outcome of a successful city, any city. These urban problems are very serious, but then these problems are dwarfed by other cities in the region. Look at Riyadh, Casablanca, Algiers, or Cairo. If you can fix it in Cairo, you can fix it in any other city around the world. <laughs> I'm also in love with Cairo, by the way. Even in Cairo, I do not think we have reached the point of no return. There's hope. It's the curse of our profession to be optimistic. The promises that big data, computation, and smart technologies bring to the future of cities, these promises are immense. We're only seeing the first generation of solutions and products. More hope is yet to come. Just to give you an example, at the School of Architecture and Planning, we are very invested in realizing these promises. With a department, between the departments of Urban Studies and Planning and the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, we have just launched last year a new program in urban science that promises to address all of these challenges. But we also believe that the solutions cannot come from science and technology alone. We believe that solutions come from the ones who live the problems and that the technology empowers those people to enact more efficiently, effectively, democratically. Our goal is not to produce another efficient technocratic city. How many times in the past have we tried to rely on technology alone to fix cities and we have failed? As we deal with a new kind of technology, big data, artificial intelligence, autonomy, and with a new scale of urban problems, mega cities, congestion, refugee problems, unmatched in any time before, we, we not we look a bit more at the questions of how the convergence of technology and society has to be orchestrated. But as you do, as you look at all of these problems, please keep in mind that we will thrive as strangers if we find the places to interact and thrive and build on our differences, and that good cities orchestrate these differences by mixture, and that the civil society that brings them together gives guidance to the future. Keep in mind, please, that the most sustainable of cities are the ones that learn from themselves. Back to Beirut. Strangers still feel at home in Beirut. They feel welcome, no matter how dire their conditions of strangeness are. The pulse of the city is still there, simply because the people are still stronger than the building code, for better or for worse and that those same people, at their best, when all else fails them, still take matters in their hands, again for better or for worse, to generate their own electricity, their own solutions. And along the way, they show us a privacy, perseverance, and resilience that are unmatched. Isn't Beirut beautiful? I hope it is clear to you by now, I'm desperately in love. <laughs> قدمتم اهلا ووطئتم سهلا في جامعه ماساتشوستس للتكنولوجيا. Thank you.